what happens when a new chess tactic is invented. Welcome to ASMR Chess and this video where you and I will work together to answer that question. And in, ons in order to answer this question, we must travel back in time to 1889, to Amsterdam, and a master chess tournament that saw the world champion, the great legend Emmanuel Lasker, with the white pieces, open up a game with pawn to F for the bird's opening. He was playing against Johann Hermann Bauer, an Austrian chess master in this matchup. Before we see his reply, let's talk a little bit about what pawn to f4 is really doing. It is controlling one key center square, a dark square, we note. But it's doing so from the side, not putting a pawn in the center as we would usually do. So is there some upside to doing this that can justify playing f4 instead of the more usual pawn to e4 or pawn to d4? There are some very subtle points about this move quite interesting and telling about the game. One thing that it does is in the far future when we have drawn up the map of the battlefield and developed all the pieces, it allows a rook to come to f1, develop itself behind the pawn and go to h3 with a potential attack against a castled king. Very, very subtle detail that Lasker is playing for already on move one. Bauer said, if you are not going to put a pawn in the center and claim the advantage in that way, well then I will pawn to d5. Modest pawn to e3 by Lasker. And we see the strategy begin to manifest on the board. This is a dark square strategy. This guy and this guy are controlling the two dark squares in the center. That is how Lasker is going to develop his game plan dark square play. Bauer played knight to f6. So this is on a dark square. A knight on the dark square will always attack light squares. This pawn is also attacking light squares. And this here and here, right? So we see a dark squared strategy paired up against a light squared strategy. Pawn to b3 by Lasker, showing his intent to play the bishop out in what is known as the Fian Cato position, exercising more control on, you guessed it, the dark squares. Power played pawn to e6, solidifying this pawn here attacking more light squares and getting ready to develop his dark squared bishop so that if the dark square attack, the dark square strategy from white gets too powerful, we will have it defended by the bishop. We see that in action right now. Bishop to b2, attacking the knight and exercising all this control over the center on the dark squares. Therefore, bishop to e7, defending the knight also 
getting the king ready to castle at a moment's notice, we see the first great surprise of this king. It would be congruent, I guess is the word, with White's plan to play knight f3, controlling these two dark squares even more and also starting to get ready to castle. This move was not played. Instead, we saw a curious move. Bishop to d3. Now, this is very, very telling. Look at these two bishops here. These two bishops tell the story of this game and this new chess tactic that Lasker invents for the purpose of winning this game. This bishop move looks uh, very peculiar. It violates some chess principles that we always teach. We always teach put the knight out before the bishops if you don't have a very particular reason for not doing so. And also the bishop, when it comes here to d3, is blocking this pawn that can no longer advance to the center. For instance, a move like pawn to d3 could be crucial at some point to defend the light square infiltration, stopping knights from coming here, for instance. It's no longer possible after bishop to d3. Bauer said, OK, you have your dark square plane. That means that you are leaving the light squares behind. I will play on the light squares. He played pawn to b6 with the idea of developing the bishop exercising this light square control. Still we don't see knight f3. No. Knight c3. Finally attacking a little bit of the light squares in the position. Bishop to b7. And now Lasker can hold back no longer. It is time to develop this knight. Knight to f3. We have almost completed development for both sides. Completing development means to get all your pieces in play on their optimal squares because they are quite awkward in their starting position. So we want to complete development. Knight to d7, knight b d7 from Bauer and we can see almost all of the pieces have left the back rank, certainly all the light pieces have for white, so it is time to castle. And also black decides to castle, this is the moment. How to develop the game from here for white. The strategy, which is very different, of course, from the tactics, the strategy being the long-term plan, the concepts, the more abstract ideas according to which you play a certain game. Um, the strategy for white here is to control the dark squares and to attack the king using strong bishops, the rook, and this forward pawn on the f-file allowing a flank attack like this towards the king. So how to get on with that strategy? We need more pieces towards the king. Therefore this curious knight to e2. Looks like it's undeveloping, going backwards, but this knight is on a journey and it's 
going towards the king's side. It does leave the queen's side, though. So pawn to c5 is immediately played by black, saying, okay, if you're going to be if you're going to weaken yourself over here, well then I will exploit that weak weakness and I will assert my dominance on this side of the board where you are weak. Undeterred by this, Lasker plays knight to g3. Notice that all the pieces are still on the board. This is a quiet developing game, but it will not stay that way. When all the energy has been concentrated and when the spring has been compressed to its maximum, it will fire and Lasker will fire in this game. The question is how? And let's explore that question. The only move needed to complete development for black is to get the queen off the back rank. Queen to say c7 just does just that. We say often that you can tell that you are, have finished your development when the two rooks on the back rank can see each other and protect each other. So development has been completed. The queen move here is on a dark square if you notice that, and it is preparing to say, okay, I have all the light square control, let me take the dark squares as well, preparing a little bit to push this pawn, not just yet, of course, because it's not adequate defin adequately defended yet, but at some point it could be. And if you lose the dark squares as white, of course, it's going to be a great, great disadvantage. You have played the whole game to control the dark squares. And that explains this next maneuver. Knight comes into e5. This knight is, of course, very strong. It is invading black's side of the board. It can't really be tolerated. Therefore, knight takes knight. And how do we recapture perhaps with the pawn to open up the rook? No. We recapture with the bishop to attack the queen and the point, the true point is not attacking the queen. The queen can slide out of the way no problem. The point is to not close in this bishop because this bishop is looking at the king along with this other bishop. Quite happily, Bauer played queen to c6 on a light square. g2 is a light square. And there is a threat with this move on g2 because if d4 is allowed, is white, if white allows black to play d4, there will be a checkmate threat. The queen is threatening to come in here with checkmate. So Lasker played queen to e2. This is what we call a prophylactic move, responding to the threat before it really materializes on the board because the queen is now covering g2. Also, this is pointing in a different direction on the light squares now. This queen is working with this bishop on these light squares. Wherever the bishop goes on these light squares, here or here, it will be protected by the queen. For instance, a move like this does not look very pleasant. The queen is caught in the crossfire and only has this backward square on developing to go to. Potentially also the bishop in some variations could be threatening to come to a6, threatening to exchange itself for this light squared bishop. And if that goes, well, a lot of 
the light square play a lot of the light square strategy of black will have been in vain and therefore we see pawn to a6 by black and this does work this move does stop both queen bishop coming to a6 and to b5 with an attack on the queen but it does not stop the attack on the king and it is actually at this moment with only a couple of knights having been traded off that the game is actually decided there is a forcing line that white can and did play here inventing a new chess, chess tactic that had never been seen before um, to uh, to get a full point home from this position here and you have to notice details when you play chess to be like uh, Sherlock Holmes a little bit inspect everything and find all the hidden connections and things that you can exploit or use to your advantage all the hidden pieces of knowledge and there is one really 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 tiny uh, detail in this position which is that this bishop is not defended and if this queen wasn't here this bishop wouldn't be defended either so just uh, save that little bit of information somewhere in the back of your mind as we investigate the next couple of moves the first forcing move is knight to h5 protected by the queen um, and threatening to come in and capture the knight being recaptured by the bishop which will be recaptured by the bishop which will be recaptured by this pawn uh, with when this pawn is here there is a gaping hole towards the black king that the queen can come in and the rook can come in and exploit with a dangerous attack however it seems it seems like this problem can be easily averted by just capturing the knight which is exactly what black did like so now he was banking on the fact that there were no new chess tactics invented uh, he could of course only play with the knowledge that he had he was not the intellectual juggernaut that dr emmanuel lasker professor of mathematics writer of philosophy friend of einstein and the longest reigning world chess champion in history 27 years old was and he was not able to you know invent these new test tactics that lasker was so he was thinking lasker will capture the knight and it looks of course very strong it looks like it's working together with this bishop to threaten a checkmate here however if this happened with it which it didn't pawn to f5 would stop all of white's attacking ideas um, it's just spoiling the great fun that the german genius lasker would have so he didn't capture the knight He did not capture the knight he would like to capture the knight but he didn't because it allows black the time to move We're still thinking about these two bishops this one that's not protected this one's only protected by the queen hmm. how about this little thing bishop takes h7 check this type of bishop sacrifice is not a new chess tactic this is called the greek gift um, 
after Giochino Greco, who was not Greek, but his uh, name meant the Greek, um, who uh, in the six, early 1600s uh, published uh, books with constructed chess games to show his different tactical inventions. And this type of bishop sacrifice to lure the king out was one of his inventions. And it, uh, it's part of every chess player's arsenal, and it can be used in many circumstances. This is not the invention. The king takes the bishop. What does it do? Got rid of one pawn protecting the king. And also, it allowed for queen takes knight to be check. This is now check. Meaning that there's no time to play any defensive move like this or like this. There's only one legal move and it is to humbly go back into the castle. And here it is that Lasker stunned the world and sacrificed the second bishop as well. Bishop takes g7. So bishop takes g7 must be captured by the king because it's simply threatening checkmate by the queen. So you have to capture this. It's a very forcing line. But now Lasker has sacrificed two bishops. That is a lot of what we would call material to be uh, behind. He only got these two pawns for it, but which pawns? The pawns that were supposed to shield the Black Majesty. And because he had played the bird's opening, he had the rook able to come in and swing out and aid in the attack. However, however, you can't do that just yet. If you play rook out now, rook to g8 wins the game for black because it allows, when the check is thrown, the king to escape and you now just two bishops down for nothing at all except these two pawns that are no longer that relevant because the king has found himself a new castle. So this whole forcing sequence has to be played you know, absolutely search with surgical precision. And the move is queen check first. This is very typical. This idea you can use in your own games very, very often. When you have the exposed king, consider if you need to check it to get it to move to a more desirable square for you and a less desirable square for them in order to carry out your attack. So this queen check for king h7, not king h8, which is worse, king h7, and now rook f3, because it looks like the game is just about to end, right? Just about to end. This is going to be checkmate. How can you stop that? Well, there is a way to stop that. Maybe you can come up with an idea. There is a single move to avoid this checkmate. And the move is pawn pushing one square forward to e5. So that when Lasker plays rook h3 check, which he did, the queen can block. This is now not checkmate, but Lasker can capture the queen. Okay. That is what he does. Rook takes queen, check, forcing the only possible reply. King takes 
rook. So, okay, black lost the queen, but white sacrificed two bishops and a rook in order to win the queen. And if we do a material count, we can see that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, six pawns, which worth each uh, one point each, six points, three points plus three points, an additional six points for the bishops. We're up to 12 points and then five and five for the rooks, meaning that black has a fighting power of 20 two points. We have all the pawns here for white, so that's eight plus nine for the queen, so that's seventeen plus five for the rook, twenty-two. There is an even amount of firepower, of fighting power on material left on the board. So when Lasker started calculating all of this, start beginning with this knight move that had to be backed up by the double bishop sacrifice, he had to come in his mind's eye to this position and then notice that small, small, subtle detail we discussed earlier. That this bishop and this bishop are both undefended. So at the end of this incredible tactic, there is a very, very simple tactic. A fork, a double attack, queen to d7, attacking this bishop and this bishop, only one of them can be saved. And that is how we get the advantage from this incredible new chess tactic that we have invented. Which one should you uh, save? Which bishop should we save here as black? This one, bishop f6, because it's closest to the king, and the king is still very exposed. This rook can come in and join the attack against the king. We want to be able to protect him to avoid checkmate. Also, this lures the queen a little further away from the king. Queen takes b But now, white is winning the game. White is winning the game. And I guess if two top grandmasters today had this position, black would probably resign. But uh, to, to Lasker's chagrin, black did not resign. He was actually extremely stubborn, maybe one of the most stubborn uh, master level games I have ever seen, refusing to resign. So how uh, can we finish this off as white? King comes to g7 for black. And this guy is in a little bit of an interesting position because he knows now that if he wins this game, which is, it looks like he's about to do, uh, his, this game will become immortal because every chess player, even club players, all tournament players, they will study this game to understand this double bishop sacrifice new tactic. And it is today, uh, in a part of the repertoire, a part of the arsenal uh, of, of every single serious chess player in the world. We we'll have to know this because it is a crucial weapon that you want at your disposal if that is what the position calls for. The king is moving towards this bishop, protecting it. You, you could say that, you know, um, that maybe we could have played something like pawn takes here with an idea of sniping the rook. The problem is queen takes this pawn, pinning the bishop to the king. There is no capturing the, the, the rook. That is why we see this king g7. 
and the rook the last piece that hasn't been part of the game just yet slides over to f1 and is getting ready to come in in the attack rook to b8 with an attack on the queen hoping perhaps for queen takes a6 and getting the queen further away from the king Lesk could capture this pawn he could also capture this pawn he does neither he plays the queen d7 he wants to come in on g4 and check that's a bit of a problem because the king doesn't have any escape square therefore rook on f8 to d8 attacking the queen that's not really the important part the important part is giving this escape square so that queen g4 check a now it's possible to go to f8 but the attack continues pawn takes pawn on e5 with an attack on the bishop you can't capture this because queen here threatening the bishop if the bishop moves there's checkmate on f7 just a little small detail so the bishop drops back also trying to defend the king and Lasker presses on e6 threatening rook takes pawn and the subtle point behind it is that the only way to defend it can be adequately defended but the only way to do it is rook b7 and now the rooks are not protecting each other again we have two unprotected pieces and Lasker was an expert at exploiting that get a little bit of a flashy move queen g6 this of course cannot be captured because it would put our king in check which is not allowed and it is threatening rook takes pawn rook takes pawn and queen takes rook with checkmate but there is a defensive resource pawn to f6 protected by the bishop and Lesker was cold as ice and willing to sacrifice to get the full point home and he played with the force of a sledgehammer trusting in his very accurate mathematical mind that would a was able to calculate these beautiful variations all the way to the finish rook takes f6 check giving up the exchange bishop takes rook which is forced and queen takes bishop with check and forcing a move forcing exactly the move that Lasko wants because it's also attacking this rook so if the king goes to g8 we just capture the rook very easily winning so the king has to come here to back to his starting square on e8 and now just a little bit of precision is needed this rook is not protected queen h8 check the king of this pawn is taking away these two squares so unfortunately king here with an idea of coming here which would actually probably be get uh, do a lot to get black back in the game is not possible you cannot go towards the queen you only have this move coming forward taking the queen also with the rook but queen g7 check you can't defend this rook you can capture the pawn which is what bauer did but now the rook falls and here black also did not resign 
despite the fact that he has four pawns against seven pawns and a rook against a queen. And this annoyed Lasker. And we will see his annoyance on the board uh, in a very uh, cool way a little bit later. So he, Lasker is threatening to come in and capture this pawn with check then picking up the other pawn, therefore rook to d6 defending this pawn. Okay, we capture the other one. Power still not resigning. This abide, how much material is he down? He has eight points, so all his, his entire army is less powerful than one of white's pieces and in addition to that there are seven pawns so uh, white is up by seven pawns seven points in fighting power somehow undeterred by this uh, he uh, presses on power does with pawn to, to d4 okay pawn takes pawn and pawn takes pawn and Lesker is saying, are you really forcing me to play this side? Okay, I will make a new queen. I will play pawn to h4, going down to <laughs> make a new queen. Please resign the game. And, uh, before we see the final moves, I'll just uh, be a good YouTuber and block my Patreon and say that's patreon.com slash ASMR chess. And you can get exclusive videos there and come and hang out in the ASMR chess Discord and support the channel um, if you feel that the world needs more as much as you can help me achieve that okay with that out of the way how uh, how did the game end for now to uh, to d3 and Like this is just trolling. You could capture that with the pawn. Lasker did not capture that with the pawn. He had enough. So he played queen takes pawn. Which is sort of just screaming at black. Resign the game. I'm giving up my queen for your rook and you can't capture it. Because if rook takes queen, pawn takes and this end game is so easily winning that I am very confident I could beat Magnus Carlsen himself from this position. You cannot defend against these pawns coming down and becoming queens and these pawns coming down and becoming queens. Maybe you can defend one side, but then the other side will queen. If you defend the other side, the one side will queen. So finally, after this <laughs> move by a very annoyed German genius, Bauer finally resigned the game. And that is how we got a new chess tactic in our arsenal as chess players. The Lasker double bishop sacrifice. That is the video and that is the game. I hope you enjoyed it, I hope you relaxed, I hope you had a great time, I sure did. Thank you very much for watching and I hope I will see you in the next video.